the microphone. Uh, yeah, we have we haven't had a great deal of luck with the, the mics except for the podium mic. Yeah, I think that would probably be the the most favorite thing. And if you have a question, I'll just repeat it. So. Uh, question is, what happens to pesticides and herbicides when they go through a living machine? John. John. <laughs> and, and heavy metals. Not okay, I, I've actually mentioned where heavy metals goes before, but I'll mention it again. They, they are literally degraded, broken down. In other words, snipped apart and become food for the biodiversity that's in there. Uh, and I've done this even with DDT. And, Heavy metals are, don't have that fortunate ability of being eaten apart. Um, and basically what happens is that they're very rapidly sequestered to the surfaces of the highly photosynthetic algal turfs on the walls of the clear tanks. And if you want to get rid of heavy metals, that's the way you do it. And you can recycle them if you have enough. We've done that in the lab, but we've never ever thought it would ever be commercially viable. The chemical plant that we did, Tim, we had, Tim. We had, uh, we had four uh, slaves to technology. We had four labs watching this because they were trying to figure out what was going on. And I wouldn't tell them because I didn't know. But uh, we had BPA in our system, you know, bisphenol A, because we made polycarbonate. Uh, incredibly uh, toxic stuff. Uh, that was, that was pretty much gone. We, we lost all our chloroform, we lost ammonia. It was the only water that this plant ever made that didn't have those three things. <coughs> no, it breaks down. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a ringed carbon, and, you know, the system. And, but we had, to go to, we had to have some anaerobic parts of the system to get some of these things. But yeah, if we had three or four days, we could. In Texas, we had warm water, so we could do it. But yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing how the organics disappear. So Jim has built numerous living machines. He has one on a farm in Lexington. And um, I think with a little bit of persuasion, we could get him to uh, hold a class on how to do a living machine, an uh, eco-machine. It's kind of a fun thing to do. Yeah. Um, he's taught his homeschoolers how to do it. So you should, yeah, uh, talk to me or Jim, and we'll set something up. Can you flick the projector off? How, how do you pump the water through an eco machine? I can shout loudly enough, can I? No. No. <laughs> it, it won't go into the video system that way. Yes. yes. Um, the, we've been designing for a long time uh, some systems that live with daily rhythms. In other words, the direct flow from solar energy. This goes all the way back to a, a, a highly contaminated pond we were working on beginning in the early 90s. And, and it, it, uh, in other systems, there is a single pump to the beginning of the system, and then everything afterwards flows by gravity. And then there are other systems which use uh, recycling. Uh, sometimes you might want to get rid of excess nitrates, uh, and they have to go through a, uh, a oxygen, very reduced oxygen cycle in order for that to happen. And so it varies all over the map. But uh, one of the most wonderful eco machines to visit is at the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, New York, and that is the 100% carbon neutral. And it was the first building and system to be acknowledged as having met the living building challenge, which is the next bar that 
architects have set for the evolution of architecture. Yeah? Uh, I have a question for Tom. Um, the day you presented it was really sobering. Uh, this idea that Tom. we're, the problem we have in the world is people don't understand the equilibrium points that you're talking about. And I feel like if the world understood the equilibrium points, we, we would spend less time talking about reducing emissions, we would spend more time talking about sequestering. So how do we get this message out there? So the question for Tom is about equilibrium points, and if we spent more time talking about sequestering, we would... No. 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 People don't understand the magnitude of 400 parts per million right now, right? And you explained that. And so we're fooling ourselves with, unless we do some mission. But what we really have to do is get the carbon out of the air, which is about sequestering. So how do we change the, the dialogue? So we're talking about your numbers and not the fluff about the how do we change the dialogue from reducing emissions to getting carbon out of the atmosphere? Well, well what I wish I knew, because, you know, we've been trying for, well, the very first draft of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was drafted in 1989. And um, I was at the time Senior Scientific Affairs Officer for Global Climate Change and Biodiversity Issues at the UN Center for Science and Technology for Development. So I got a lot of input into that first draft, and I, you know, put into it a lot of stuff to make it scientifically sound, including complete accounting of all greenhouse gas sources and sinks, um, some sort of uh, statement that the purpose of the treaty was to prevent, um, well, was to protect the most climatically sensitive ecosystems. All of that stuff got taken out by governments. They didn't want to have detailed accounting. So, you know, it's the, the one number, there are only a couple good numbers that we have. One is a concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the second is the amount of fossil fuels that are produced, because those numbers are very well known. Everything else is sort of really sloppy, and they didn't want to have to count for it. So when you talk about saying, well, wait a minute, there's five times more carbon in the soil than the, the atmosphere, you've got to you know, count for changes of that. They say, well, well, we don't know how to measure it, so we won't talk about it. And so they've managed to avoid really making the treaty scientifically sound. And unless it's scientifically sound, it can't meet its own goal. I get that. So, so, how, so do we, how do we change the dialogue? Well, that, that, I'm going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow, as a matter of fact. I mean, it's been a very slow process, but I mean, over the last, you know, since 1989, there's been almost no progress at UNFCC. They've been talking fictitious numbers, in, in fact. Um, that's beginning to change, although what's happened in the U.S. in the last week is about to set it back a great deal. But the rest of the world community is moving forward pretty much. And the U.S., Russia, and the OPEC countries are going to be, be dragging their feet every, every step of the way. But most of the rest of the world is beginning to get it. I'm not really yet sure what will happen here in, um, you know, in, in Marrakesh, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic we're, we're turning in the right direction. I'll talk a little more about that tomorrow. Yeah, but I mean, the point is, is that the politicians are the ones who decide what gets done with the money, and restoration and soils are not even in the treaty at all. So they're not, ad addressing them are not objectives of the treaty, and until, it's, you know, it's, it's logical, the treaty makes sense, it, it's, it's just fiction. <laughs> if I can add something to that, um, I go to these environmental policy discussions at Harvard, MIT, and other places, and I bring this stuff up. You can too. Sometimes I carry the geotherapy book and hold it up in front and let people see it, right? And it can happen. You know, I, Jeffrey Sachs talk, talked here at Harvard Law School a while. I had the book with me. He took a picture of the book. Maybe he's going to read it. At least he knows about it. We can change the discussion, especially here in Cambridge, because we can begin this dialogue. Uh, Christiana Figueres, who is the outgoing UNFCC C commissioner, talked at UMass. When she talked at UMass, I asked her the question. You talked about emissions. You didn't talk about sinks, right? So bringing it up in public fora, bringing it up at the colleges and universities, bringing it up to the politicians who come here is a way to change the dialogue. And we can do that. We can do that individually and collectively. And if we do it loud enough, maybe they'll change. I have one quick suggestion, and that would be to take the Millinocket Mill or the Bucksport Mill and the hundreds of thousands of acres in Maine and, and begin a biochar product plant there, 
and start to do it. Okay. Take, take a run down old mill and a hundred people who are out of work and show that you can, you can do it. And you don't have to tra travel very far to find a lot of wood biomass. And nobody knows what we're going to do with it. Yeah. Wood biomass that would otherwise just uh, sit there and oxidize. Um, uh, any, any more questions? Yes, in the back. The question was about with what we understand about microbes and our growing understanding about microbes and microbiomes, what can we do to restore ecosystem health? I think broadly is kind of what you're getting at. Uh, and after I addressed that one, the gentleman who's operating the camera had a question. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer that as well. But um, so I think that the, the uh, one of the things we, the, the, from my point of view, uh, I have the responsibility to wear different hats, right? And so as, a, as, a, as an academic, uh, I express what the data say and, and tell us, and then of course I have my own uh, personal opinions. Those are usually in lockstep, but not always. One of the things that uh, I think does get overlooked in our community is the impact that, uh, no, I'm sorry, not overlooked, but one of the things that we are not as aggressive on is the impact of synthetic fertilizers. This is a really, really, really big deal. And the Green Revolution uh, was a temporary, in my opinion, blip in our ability to increase productivity, but its net uh, sort of damage is, is greater than its net benefits. Uh, so in a very real sense, if you want to restore uh, soil microbiome health, what you need to do is, is spend some time realizing what makes sense for the environment in which you live. So the plants here in Massachusetts, the endemic plants, uh, are different than those uh, in even in Connecticut in our neighboring states, at least in some cases. Uh, we all live in our little microclimates. But do what you can to uh, stimulate and sustain the productivity of, of your land, even at your, the scale of your home. Uh, so that refers to sort of the soil microbiome. The same can be said for the ocean, right? So much of these oxic dead zones or these hypoxic dead zones actually relate to fertilizer runoff. So once again, we're looking at synthetic fertilizer. And at another time and place, you know, we, have, we may have the opportunity to talk about the mechanics of why that happens. But the punchline is you're causing organisms to bloom uh, that uh, end up having deleterious effects to ecosystem balance. That's really what it comes down to. So I think it, and that actually holds true for our microbiome in our gut. Well done. And that means getting rid of the fertilizers and pesticides. And I wanted to acknowledge Lori Cesar, Lori, if you could just raise your hand. She's well done, Lori. She's <laughs> conquered, and it's a wonderful model. I yeah. encourage anyone who wants to do a similar thing in their own community to try to get homeowners, property owners to turn their backyard, their properties back to nature so that they function yeah. help, helpfully with the yep. carbon nutrient water cycle. Um, and this will get us with what you're talking about, the foster health and the microbiome, the mi microbes in our uh, in our To briefly say that into the microphone, uh, Sharon is telling us about restoration efforts in Concord, particularly, um, if I may kind of editorialize a little bit, around lawns and all of the <coughs> toxic substances that are used to maintain lawns. Um, there are 41 million or so acres of lawns in this country, which is more than many agricultural products, including corn, et cetera, and so forth. And we can make a big contribution by going back to indigenous lawns. So Laurie has started an organization in Concord, Concord called uh, Biodiversity Climate Action Network, 
or BioCan, and um, this is, we hope, will be a model for many communities. So I think maybe we'll take one more question. Well, well, we're ask, yeah. Yeah. Gentlemen with the camera, by the way, thank you for those of you operating the cameras. You haven't had a chance to speak today. Let me answer that gentleman's question quickly, and then I'll turn it back to Anna. But uh, the gentleman behind the camera asked about, are there microbes that, that can, um, can sort of sequester radioactive materials, or there are microbes that can break down radioactive materials? Um, these elements that are radioactive decay at a rate that we cannot easily influence, certainly not micro can't influence. Uh, and you know, microbes are not alchemists, so they're not turning plutonium into gold or lead, but what they can do is change uh, aspects of their um, mineral state, if you will, and make them less mobile. And so microbes have been thought of, have been considered seriously in terms of um, immobilizing uranium, for example, and keeping it in its less soluble form. This is true for microbes uh, and arsenic and many other substances in nature. That is a very, very uh, real area of investigation. And one of the big barriers for all of this uh, comes down to what I would say uh, um, uh, a lack of, of, of a concerted voice and effort among the academics and small businesses that are pursuing these. So hopefully there's a way to, to, um, to break past that, and put them to good use. Just a, a point of interest, there's a great article by um, a mineralogist named Robert Hazen uh, who talks about the mineral species on Earth. There are something like three to 500 on other planets, and there are around 5,000 on Earth, and that's because the microbes got into the mineral business. So one final question, gentlemen, with the John, white hat. John has left, but I wonder if any of the rest of you have either had any experience with or have any insights about the oil cleanup, ongoing oil cleanup issues in the Gulf after the BP catastrophe, and specifically the claim by some that Corexit, the use of Corexit was a big mistake, that there was an alternative available, and what to do now about this Corexit crap sitting at the bottom of the ocean of the Gulf. Question, question about the uh, aftermath of the, the BP oil disaster in the Gulf and the leftovers and what we can do about it. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll share with you uh, a bit about uh, the research. Um, let's break it down into three simple points. So one is many of the constituents disappeared far more quickly than we expected. That's the good news. Number two, many of the constituents ended up in the deep ocean and were not degraded. We, and, and, oil, and there's a big push by oil and gas to say they're gone, but we keep finding evidence for it on the seafloor. So, and don't think that it's out of sight, out of mind. Again, this has not only an impact on the ecology of those organisms, but once again, fisheries, right? Uh, mo many of our commercially relevant fishes start off as juveniles. They live down at around 1,000 meters or lower. And so they're in contact with those, and that's a, a, a real issue. Point number three, the dispersants, dispersants continuously to be shown to be more toxic than the oil itself, period. So I'll let Tom chime in. Yeah, OK. I, I just added a couple things there. I mean, the, the thing is that what blew out was a mixture of a lot of things, gases, liquids, semi-solids. So, you know, that, that raw oil, so to speak, included methane gas, it included liquid hydrocarbons, it included asphalt-type hydrocarbons. What happens to that is when it goes boiling up to the surface, while the volatile stuff volatilizes into the atmosphere, people say, oh, it's gone. Okay, well, it didn't. It volatilizes into the atmosphere. And some of it coagulates. But the thing is, the heavy stuff never made it to the top. It just sank to the bottom. And it wasn't until they went down you know, a year or two later with submarines, there's this oil sludge killing everything on the bottom. And they said, oh, we didn't realize that was there. You know, so the heavy fraction went down, the light fraction went up. Now, when that happened, people were very excited to measure the methane because they thought they'd be able to use that as a tracer to determine the movements of the water through the Gulf and see where it went. And when they got there to measure the methane, it was all gone couldn't measure anything. And, and what happened is very interesting, is that there was essentially a bloom of methane oxidizing bacteria that suddenly had dinner all over the place, and they ate it all pretty quickly. And that, I mean, you know, you can't count on that happening. 
I mean, the, so some of the really toxic heavy compounds probably have not been degraded at all. Those are piling up in the salt marshes and the oysters and everything else. There's an interesting story about a woman who, someplace I believe in Alabama or Mississippi, was the world's expert on larval crabs. She'd spent like 40 years, you know, fishing out these larval crabs out of the Gulf of Mexico, microscopic, and studying them. And she'd, she spent 40 years doing that. And all of a sudden, after the oil spill, the larval crabs were full of oil droplets, and they looked sick and dying. And she said, wait a minute, there's something, I've never seen this before in 40 years, you know, there's something happening here. They cut all her funding. <laughs> they cut her funding completely. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you all for coming. I, I wish you a good night. I, I just... One, one comment about the, the self-organizing uh, qualities of the natural world. Uh, after talking about that for a while, during a conference, someone came up to me and said, wow, it's wonderful how this conference was just self-organizing. <laughs> Didn't quite work that way, but we appreciated the thought. <laughs>